Welcome to the Faith Broadcast. I'm Carrick Butler. I lead Faith Christian Center right here in Austell, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in today. I believe today's message is going to equip you and empower you to make Jesus famous in your everyday life. As you listen, something good is going to happen to you. So listen up to the message, apply it, and I'll talk to you after today's message. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Continuing our verse-by-verse journey through the book of Acts. And it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So let's examine what they're saying. So these people came from Jerusalem area. And they come to this booming church in Antioch. We looked at how important the church of Antioch is and how we should aspire to be a church like Antioch. And we know Paul, Barnabas, and another other, number of other prophets and teachers are there. But these teachers, or so-called teachers, come from Jerusalem. They come to this church, and they begin to teach. And one of the main things they say is, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Remember that circumcision was a sign of the law and the old covenant. The word manner means the usage as prescribed by law. So what was the essence of the teaching? If you do not keep the law as Moses said it, you cannot be saved. So what is this declaring? That believing in Jesus is not enough for salvation, but keeping the law was required for salvation. So this is what they came to declare, that everything that Jesus came to freely offer In salvation, where there's healing, where there's preservation, where there's provision, where there's deliverance, everything Jesus came to freely offer, they're now come saying, believing in Jesus is not enough. Now you have to do everything that Moses said. Remember, the church in Antioch is a uh, multicultural church, so there are Jews, but there's also Gentiles. Now, how did Paul and Barnabas react? Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, Meaning in King James English, they started talking to Paul and Barnabas and said, now we ain't having it. And they went toe to toe with them, not in a quiet way, but a very confrontational way. Say, hey, what you're saying is wrong. You are false teachers. Now, the discussion grew so big that the church determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, meaning the church funded Paul and Barnabas and that team to go to Jerusalem. As Paul and Barnabas and the team head to Jerusalem, they pass through Phoenicia and Samaria. And as they go through these cities and their churches, they declare the conversion of the Gentiles. So people who aren't Jews are being saved. And they tell it to all the churches as they go through. And they cause great joy unto all the believers. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received, which means they were received gladly or they were welcome of the church and of the apostles and the elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Remember, the Pharisees and Sadducees were parts of sects that resisted Jesus and resisted the early church. But when we look at Acts chapter 6, it says many of the Pharisees joined the faith. So many Pharisees have gotten saved. And so in this meeting, you have people who were Pharisees. They're saved. They believe in Jesus. But they also believe, okay, they're saved, but they need to do all these other things as well. They said it was needful to circumcise them, all the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. So the whole church is gathered. The Pharisees are saying one thing. Paul and Barnabas are saying another thing. So the apostles and the elders, these are the pastors and leaders of the church of Jerusalem outside of the 12 apostles. They come together in a smaller conference to discuss this matter. One of the things I said as I began this series, the book of Acts, one of the things you'll see when you really pay attention to the book of Acts is the humanity of our biblical heroes. They're still trying to figure this out. Right now, it's 18 years after the day of Pentecost, but they're still trying to figure this out. And as they come together to discuss, and they have been much disputing, Peter stood up and said, men and brethren, you know how a good while ago, about nine or 10 years ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So they have this big discussion, and then Peter gets up and starts adding his piece to it. But before we get to what Peter had to say, let's go to Galatians chapter two. Because The book of Acts is Luke's account of this discussion. Galatians chapter 2 is Paul's account of this discussion. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. And one of the things, remember, we said in the previous weeks that the first missionary journey, 
Paul went to these churches in Galatia. So when you read through the book of Galatians, you're reading to the people that Paul encountered on his first missionary journey. So verse 1, it says, Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and I took Titus with me also. Why is it important that Titus came? Because Titus is a Gentile. He's not a Jew like Paul and Barnabas. And Paul says, He went up by revelation and communicate unto them that gospel, that good news which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. So what he's talking about of reputation, he's talking about the small conference of apostles and elders and those in that smaller meeting. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain, but neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, being a Gentile, was compelled to be circumcised. So even though he was a Gentile, they didn't make him be circumcised to be part of this meeting. And that because of false brethren unaware brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. So there were Pharisees that really believed in Jesus, but inside that group of Pharisees were people who snuck into the church who really didn't believe, but they wanted to make sure these new group of Jews who believe in Jesus do the same thing that Moses told them to do. So they snuck into the church to bring them into bondage, Paul says. Another translation says they brought, they came to bring us under their same religious shackles. But notice what Paul had to say about that. It says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for our, another translation, we didn't listen to a minute of it. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of those who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accept no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. So he said, I had one address in public, but had a different address to the apostles and the elders and those who were in that conference. The message version says it this way. While we were in conference, we were infiltrated by spies pretending to be Christians who slipped in to find out just how free true Christians are. Their ulterior motive was to reduce us to their brand of servitude. We didn't give them the time of day. We were determined to preserve the truth of the message for you. So now let's go back to the book of Acts, verse 7 of chapter 15. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know how a good while ago, nine or ten years ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the hearts, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them. Look at this next key phrase. Purifying their hearts by what? So God purified the Gentiles' hearts by faith and not the works of the law. Peter goes on and says, now therefore, why do you tempt God? Another translation, why do you challenge God? Another translation, why are you trying to out-God God? To put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples. So these aren't just new believers. These are people who are committed to following God, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Why are you trying to make them do what we can't even do? Why are you trying to make them keep commandments we couldn't even keep? Why are you trying to do something that God told you not even to do in the first place? Why are you adding extra God rules when God didn't even give these rules? This is what Peter's asking. And if you study Peter's character in the Gospels, Peter's not quiet. Peter is prone to put his foot in his mouth. So I'm sure this address wasn't quiet. I'm sure it's true Peter style. Verse 11, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. When it says through grace, remember grace is 19 different definitions. So here it's talking about through the gift of God we're saved. So this is what he's saying. We didn't work to be saved. It's a gift. We just believed and we received. He said if we believed and received, why should we try to make them work for it? Verse 12. Then all the multitudes got silent. Peter shut them up. And gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Now let's look at the rest of Paul's account when we look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. We'll read from the New Living Translation now. Instead, they saw that God had given me the responsibility of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he has given Peter the responsibility of preaching to the Jews. For the same God who worked through Peter as the apostle to the Jews also worked through me as the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, James, this is Jesus' little brother, Peter and John 
who were known as the pillars of the church recognized the gift God had given me, and they accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. Now bounce back to Acts 15. So this, the conference is over. So now they're going to, about to share their findings with the rest of the congregation. Now, when Peter's done talking, Paul and Barnabas is done talking, Jesus' little brother has something to say. Now, one of the things, as you read through the book of Acts, at the very beginning, you see Peter's leadership in Jerusalem. And then you get to the middle of the book of Acts, it begins to focus on Paul's ministry. But as Peter's traveling in different places, he's not leading the church at Jerusalem. James has become the leader of the church of Jerusalem. He is the pastor of that church. You see his influence even when Peter is released from jail. And Peter said, go tell James and the other brothers what has happened. So James is the leader of the church at Jerusalem. He's a very respected individual. As you study history, not only does he have the respect of the church, he had the respect of all the Jews in the area. He is a very highly regarded man of God. So James answers saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to, his, to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, says the Lord, who does all these things. And he says, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore, my sentence is, my judgment is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles who are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication, from things strangled, and from blood. So he says four things. We'll get to that in a moment. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judah or Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting to the brethren which are, are of the Gentiles and Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Forasmuch as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave so, no such commandment. In other words, we didn't send them, they sent themselves. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So now James is giving their stamp of endorsement. Not only are we agreeing with Paul has to say, we love him. We love Barnabas. We love your leaders. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize their sacrifice. We recognize how they put themselves in dangerous positions for the sake of Jesus. We have also sent, therefore, Judah and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. So as they're making the decision, they're checking with their spirit. All right, what seems good to the Holy Ghost? So it doesn't mean they have the Holy Ghost said thus, thus, this, this. They're saying, well, do we have peace with this? Yeah, the Holy Ghost seems to agree with the decisions we're making. To lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from meat offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, which is sexual immorality, from which if you keep yourselves, or if you guard yourselves, you shall do well, well fare ye well. So look at these four things. Stay away from food that has been sacrificed to idols. Don't eat or drink blood. Don't eat things that have been strangled. And four, stay away from sexual immorality. We know the fourth one is clearly a sin. We see it all throughout the New Testament. But what about the first three? Why are those three so important and listed with the fourth one? Paul shares more concerning 1 Corinthians. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because when you look at number two and number three outside of the inhumane treatment of animals and outside of the fact that it just sounds nasty, number two and three were offensive to Jews. So they're saying, hey, don't do these things so you don't offend your Jewish brothers. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and Paul is writing the same commandment to the church at Corinth. Starting in verse 19, he says, what say I then? that the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything. He says, no, an idol is nothing. What, you, what people sacrifice to these false gods are nothing. But I say this, that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. 
And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. This is the whole act of them sacrificing to this idol, which is nothing. They're sacrificing to demons. And I don't want you to have a house party with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, communion, and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. You got to pick one. Are you going to have communion or you can go, you know, drink with demons? This is really what you got to choose, Paul's saying. Are you going to provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he is? No, so Paul goes on and says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles in the marketplace, that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not but bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, if you choose to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. But if any man say unto you, this is offered and sacrificed unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience' sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. The only three groups in the earth. You can't be a member of more than one group. You're either a Jew, you're either a Gentile, you're a member of the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they might be saved. I like how the Passion Translation says it. I'll say it this way. You say it, this is what you say. Under grace, there are no rules, and we're free to do anything we please. Paul goes, not exactly. Because not everything promotes growth in others. Your slogan, we're allowed to do anything we choose, may be true, but not everything causes the spiritual advancement of others. So don't always seek what is best for you at the expense of another. Yes, you are free to eat anything without worrying about your conscience, for the earth and all of its abundance belongs to the Lord. So if an unbeliever invites you to dinner, go ahead and eat whatever is served without asking questions concerning where it came from. But if he goes out of his way to inform you that the meat was actually an offering sacrificed to idols, then you should pass, not only for his sake, but because of his conscience. I'm talking about someone else's conscience, not yours. What good is there in doing what you please if it's condemned by someone else? So if I voluntarily participate, why should I be judged for celebrating my freedom? Whether you eat or drink, live your life in a way that glorifies and honors God. And make sure you're not offending Jews or Greeks or any part of God's assembly over your personal preferences. Follow my example. For if I try to please everyone in all things rather than putting my liberty first, I sincerely attempt to do anything I can so that others may be saved. So notice what Paul's saying. He says, just because it's lawful or just because it's not sin doesn't mean I should do it. See, a lot of people go, well, is it sin? Well, that's what babies should ask. Grown people should, is it wise for me to do so? Stop asking, well, is it sin? Go to, is it wise? Is it for me? Because people like to have this big conversation, well, is it sin to drink a little bit? Stop asking, is it sin, but is it wise? Amen. Proverbs says those who do it are fools and ready to die. Just because it's allowed for you to do so doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you don't have to repent for doing it doesn't mean you should do it in the first place. We have to be people who get above being spiritual babies to being people who live and walk in wisdom. So going back to Acts 15, so Paul is saying, so you look at verses 1 through 3, part of the main thing was not being offensive to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That if you know that if you eat this, it's going to cause them to have a rough time in their Christian journey. Don't eat it. If you know it's going to offend your Jewish brothers, then don't do it. You know, it may not be healthy for you to eat all the pork that you want. It may it might be the wisest thing to do. But if you're sitting at a table with Jews or Muslims that offend them, then don't order bacon. Just because you can, you know, well, I'm free in Christ. See, if you get saved, you can have some with me. Don't. Don't do that to offend them. Consider them. Consider your conscience. Consider their conscience. Don't put them in a bad position just because you're free to do so. That's what Paul is saying here. So the letter James is right. Yes, he says, yeah, stay away from sexual immorality. Keep your pants up. Just, yeah, don't eat things, sacrifice to demons. That's just not smart to do. But then he goes on to say, 
for the sake of your other brothers and your sisters, don't do these things. They're tr setting up ways that the church can operate together no matter what the cultural background is. And the thing is a lot of people preach personal preferences and they do it all the time, but it doesn't mean they're anointed. Some people have personal preferences that they build around the commandments of God so they don't sin. That is called boundaries. You should have boundaries. You shouldn't be tiptoeing how close you can get without sinning. You should have boundaries, but your boundaries are not gospel. And even if the Holy Ghost tells you to do it, doesn't mean it's his rule for somebody else. One example with Smith Wigglesworth, he didn't allow newspapers in his house. He said, all those things are full of lies and that's not a lot in my house. He said, keep it outside. And this was during World War II. This is before it turned downward for Hitler. Um, a man, I believe Lester Summerall was coming to visit Smith Wigglesworth. And he says, keep that newspaper outside of my house. It's full of lies anyway. They don't know what's going to happen. Hitler's going to be dead in hell soon, so come on in. He says, I don't allow newspapers. Now, can you read a newspaper? Sure you can. Can you have a newspaper in your house? Sure you can. That was his personal preference, and that was his boundary. But we can't be the ones who push our personal preferences. We push the gospel. We push the good news. And he says, for my personal walk, so that I can do what God has called me to do, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to watch this. That's my personal preference. But we have to make sure that we push the gospel, not personal preferences. And when you're in a situation where you know how some people have more stricter personal preferences, you consider them. And so, you know, we go to certain places. We had a layover heading to Africa a couple years ago, and our layover was in the Middle East. And so we were going through this Middle Eastern country, and I had researched beforehand that, you know, they were a more liberal Muslim country, but they had some issues with Westerners dressing inappropriately. And the thing was, their laws doesn't really apply to me. But I told the guys with me, so we do not offend them. We're going to make sure that we're wearing full limb jeans and a t-shirt. Why? We're not going to offend them. Now, oh, why would you do that? Because I'm not trying to offend them over something stupid. Now, it was hot. <laughs> I looked at Davis and said, if we're here any longer, I'm buying some outfits just like them. Because they look comfortable and cool. But well, the thing was, the whole purpose was, I'm not going to offend them. So like Marilyn Hickey, when she goes to Muslim lands, she dresses in their garbs. She has a closet full of the headdresses and the full-length outfits, and that's how she preaches. Now, does the Holy Ghost make her preach that way? No. What is she doing? Not offending them. Because if they saw her with her head uncovered in certain countries, they wouldn't listen to anything she had to say. But because her head is covered, they were willing to listen about her Jesus. So it's not just about what you're free to do in Christ. It's about considering the other brother and sister in the room. And also, as Paul said, considering the others so that I could win them to Christ. So you have to make those thinking, those thoughts, that, okay, I'm going, I'm going to be in different environments with the people of other religious backgrounds. How am I going to act for their conscience? How am I going to represent Christ? Am I going to push my personal preference or am I just going to push the gospel? And so you'll have people that believe a whole bunch of different things. And, you know, if you see me in my normal everyday life where I'm just out having lunch with people, I'm not going to push a lot of things. You know, there'll be people doing a whole lot of things that I know is wrong, but I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start with, do you know Jesus? I'm not going to talk about you smoking weed. I'm going to talk about you smoking weed. I need to talk to you about Jesus first. And before I even get to the weed, why do you even smoke in the first place? So I'm working towards something, the root, not the fruit. Too many times we focus on fruit and we never get the person in the first place. You know, you can't clean a fish unless you catch it. Too many Christians are trying to clean fish in the ocean and they haven't caught them in the first place. And so that's why I want people of all types of backgrounds, all places to come to this church. They may not be saved yet, but I believe the word works. I was in a minister's conference recently in Brother Joel Osteen was a speaker for 45 minutes, and he was sharing his philosophy. He says, we have people of all different religions who come to my church. He says, yeah, they're not saved when they get there. It may take them a while, but they don't stay the way they are. They get saved. He says, I just keep preaching. I just keep loving. And eventually they get saved. That's the goal. Get them into the kingdom. So I'm not going to push a personal preference. I'm going to push the kingdom. I'm going to push the love of God, the power of God, the anointing of God. 
not personal preference. Because when you push personal preference, you get very legalistic. Because the thing is, they were against Jesus because he wasn't that legalistic. It's like, he goes out to lunch with sinners. How dare he go talk to sinners? Why isn't he with the Pharisees? He's with the sinners. And so they, their insult of him, he's a friend of sinners. Well, shouldn't we be? Doesn't mean they have to be in your inner circle and that you're the ones that first turn to, but you're friendly towards sinners. You should be. Because the thing is, sinners wanted to be close to Jesus. And Jesus never compromised his stance on holiness. So if sinners never want to be close to you, you're not as much like Jesus as you think you are. Well, that's enough of that. Verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, where they gathered the multitude together, and they delivered the epistle, the letter that came from James, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation or the encouragement and the comfort. And Judas and Silas, being prophets, also themselves exhorted and encouraged the brethren with many words and confirmed them, strengthened them, and built them up. And when they had tarried there for a space, for a while, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles, notwithstanding to please Silas to abide there still. So Silas has someone, you know what, I want to stay in Antioch. And Judas says, well, I'm going to go back home. Now, before we get to even the end of chapter 15, where we're working towards right now, that it says that Paul and Barnabas continue in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. But something else happened when we get to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Peter decides to come to visit Antioch. And Paul says, when he got there, verse 11, Galatians 2, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now Peter and Paul are having a confrontation. And Paul doesn't back down. And Peter doesn't back down. Imagine these personalities. These aren't quiet gentlemen. These are both alpha personalities, face to face. Because before, before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And uh, the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Dissimulation means to hide under a false pretense. And so, under the law, the Jews did not eat with Gentiles. They kept themselves separate. But when Peter was in Antioch, he was eating with the Gentiles. He was acting and living just like he was a Gentile. But when people from James's crew came, he backed away and stopped eating with the Gentiles. And when Peter did it, the other Jews in the church of Antioch said, well, Peter's going to do it. We're going to follow him. And so much that Barnabas, one of the chief leaders, well, if Peter's going to do it, well, then I'm not going to eat with the Gentiles either. Paul wasn't having it. He went to Peter and said, you're being fake. You look at the next verse, he says, but when I saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if you being a Jew live after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He says, why are you acting like this? You've been acting like a Gentile all week, but when James's crew comes, you act like a Jew? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified, not declared not guilty, not made righteous by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. It's all by faith. It's not about what we do. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No flesh shall be declared not guilty. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. This is what he was telling Peter and everybody else in the room. He says, I don't frustrate, I don't set aside, I don't disannul the grace of God by trying to live after the law now that I'm saved. I'm not living by my works, I'm living by my faith, is what he's telling them. And so we see, even though Peter was this big champion in this conference in Jerusalem, even though Peter has done some amazing things in the book of Acts, Peter tripped up. These guys are human. 
The only perfect human in the Bible is Jesus. All the other ones had issues. And when you actually study the book of Acts, you see they had issues. They're still trying to figure this thing out. So you get to verse 36 of chapter 15 of Acts. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So Barnabas agreed, but Barnabas was determined to take with them John Mark. But Paul thought it was not good to take one with them because he departed or he deserted them in Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them. So it wasn't just a disagreement, it became an all-out fight. That they departed asunder one from the other. So they said, we're not going to work together anymore. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilia, confirming the churches, and we'll look at where they go next time. But once again, see the humanity. These are two people that God brought together. But because of relationship issues and disagreement, they broke apart sharply. They were heated. I'm sure some words were said that should not have been said. I'm sure eagles were hurt. I'm sure emotions were hurt. I'm sure people in the church of Antioch had questions like, what? They split? What's going on? But we know it didn't stay that way because you keep reading through the New Testament. Because at this point, Paul did not think John Mark was fit to go along with them because he ran away in the previous trip. But you read one of Paul's last letters. He says, hey, bring John Mark with you. He is profitable for me in the work of the ministry. See, Barnabas, who's an encourager, he's an exhorter by nature, takes John Mark, his little cousin, and builds him up some more. After Barnabas is either martyred or Barnabas moves on and does something else, John Mark becomes Peter's assistant. He becomes Peter's secretary. So Peter is pouring in to John Mark. And so although Peter's writing 1 Peter and 2 Peter, John Mark is writing it down with him. But then the ministry of John Mark keeps going to the point Paul's like, hey, I need John Mark's help. So John Mark helps Paul. But then Paul's martyred. But John Mark's still here. And the Holy Ghost is not done with him yet. So he writes the Gospel of Mark. That even though Mark, Paul might have been right, Barnabas might have been right. But the Holy Ghost was not done with Barnabas. The Holy Ghost was not done with John Mark. And the Holy Ghost was not done with Paul. We're all humans. We make mistakes. We have issues. But the Holy Ghost still chose them and worked through them. And the Holy Ghost has chosen us and has chosen to work through us. We're just vessels in the sands. And we have to remember, the more we yield, the more he'll work through us. I like what Catherine Kruman said, I'll begin to close here. God's not looking for perfect vessels. He's just looking for yielded vessels. They yielded, and we must yield as well. Stand to your feet. We'll get into chapter 16 and beyond next time. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for making it alive and real to us. We thank you that the same Holy Ghost who rested upon Jesus, the same Holy Ghost who filled and rested upon Peter and James and John and Paul and Barnabas and John Mark is the same Holy Ghost that lives within and rests upon us. We trust him for his help because we can't figure it all out by ourselves. If our biblical heroes couldn't do it by themselves, we know we can't do it by ourselves. We need the help and the leading of the Holy Ghost. So we trust you, sir, not just for your help and leading in our experiences, but in our everyday life. You say if we acknowledge you, you will direct our paths. So we acknowledge you as being the spirit of wisdom the spirit of revelation, the one who knows everything, the greater one who lives with inside of us. Lead us and help us to live by faith and not by our works. To live by our faith in the Son of God who loved us, not in the religious good things we try to do. We thank you that our right standing with you comes by faith, not by our works. And because it comes by faith, even when we mess up, we have a path to come straight to you. And that we can receive by faith everything that's in the Word of God. Every promise that's in the Word of God. We don't have to do it by our works. We don't have to work 
for our salvation. We don't have to work for our healing. We don't have to work for our deliverance. We can receive it by faith because it is the gift and grace of God. So you're the God of all grace and we receive by faith tonight every grace that we need. Hallelujah. I hope you enjoyed today's message. Thank you once again for tuning in today. You now, if you enjoyed the message, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel, download our Faith Christian Center Georgia app, as well as follow us on social media. And if you want to partner with us as a ministry, you can text FCCJ to 73256. That's FCCJ to 73256. And you can give financially support this ministry and what we do here in the metro Atlanta area as well as all around the world. Once again, thank you for tuning in today, and I'll see you next time.